The Unshackled Waves, episode 221. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. We haven't had a show catching up on the major stories that have been dominating the news cycle for a while, so today I'll do my best to get you all up to speed with friend of the Unshackled and YouTuber Johnny Moore. Welcome back. Great for having me on again, Tim. Now you've been uh, quite busy lately, we haven't crossed paths off camera, so, um, but you're still, you uploaded a video recently, you're still uh, posting when you can? Yeah, I'm still posting when I can. Usually I'm pretty busy when I'm not getting involved in politics, and so I've got to make more money with myself in the meantime. But other than that, yeah, I still I still keep some tabs on current issues and what's going on out there, like I heard about well-known YouTuber and conservative activist in the UK, Tommy Robinson. I heard about him being banned from um, both Facebook and Instagram after that panadrama rally, like protesting BBC for their lies and their political bias, and so he got kicked off for protesting them, and... Um, I think it gives you a clear indicator that they are pretty biased against like right-leaning voices or people that are that have like anti-islam anti-islamist views yeah and i think the great thing what uh, tommy had done in the past few months was put out his own media i mean he's been in the the public eye for for nearly a decade now campaigning against the islamization of britain and so he'd had many uh, run-ins with mainstream media then putting out fake news about him and of course the bbc is the the, the worst offender uh, so there was a documentary released by one of his fans a few weeks back the real tommy robinson where it goes through like obviously he's been to jail a few times it goes through it tells his side of the story about uh what exactly transpired between him and the the authorities so it's definitely worth a look but the the big one was the the panodrama documentary because uh the bbc's flagship uh, panorama program it's sort of like uh the bbc's four corners program they were they, they were planning to do as he called it a tommy takedown episode and teaming up with a a group a uh, hope not hate and uh so they were planning to do this big expose talk to all these to all his enemies and so tommy he fought back with his own documentary pano drama which uh, premiered uh last last saturday at a at a rally attended by by eight thousand people and yeah tommy was was giving it right back to them oh yeah definitely eight thousand people that's probably more than we could um that's probably more than any um anyone here could probably um get gather or get together in terms of a um political movement here in um Australia and in Melbourne. I mean like eight thousand people, yeah, he's truly got the media and he's basically got the globalists and the elite, like they're terrified. And um eight thousand people, there were other voices that came along here. I noticed there was um Arvi Gemini from like down here down under. He went over there again, like he usually flies over to um work and help those in the culture war that are on our side but um yeah he went over there as well and um i think he thinks that he's going to get banned as well too off of, off of facebook well he's ba well. been banned he's had two pages gone already he's on his third facebook page mm. yeah but he doesn't give up and i admire about that about him also what i also about my admire about tommy is that after he was banned off of facebook and instagram he he talked about it he talked about how he was banned off of social media how youtube is his last one how he got sent to jail and how he got bitten up by these by these Islamist in, inmates that were with him, basically like his um cell neighbors. <laughs> but um he never gave up. He doesn't give in to him. No matter how much suffering and pain he takes, he keeps standing up. And I think that's something to admire about him is. Uh, yeah. When he was in jail last year uh, for contempt of court for filming outside that uh, Muslim gang grooming trial, uh, which it was was overturned on, on appeal and a, and a retrial was ordered, and uh, let's not re re let's remember that the initial reporting that Tommy had been sentenced to 13 months in prison was suppressed, and so people in the UK uh, couldn't know about it. And I remember you know, when Tommy. Uh, finally got out he was really skinny because he didn't eat the meals that were prepared to him because they were prepared by the muslim inmates so he just survived on i think it was cans of tuna yeah a lot of yeah i know a lot of people of of 
Islamic faith, yeah, they don't like Tommy Robinson really well. They think he hates Muslims when he's actually, like, anti-Islam. Like, there's a difference. Anti-Islam is when you don't want to see, basically, like, halal festivities or Sharia law influencing your country's culture or your country's politics, for that matter. So, anti-Muslim is, like, basically, like, saying, like, he doesn't want Muslims here over and that. But, um... It's their ideology that he fights against, and um, everyone else, they fight f for him on that well, with the same ideology. Like, they're against it. They're against it, and, um, yeah, there was nothing they could do when he was in prison. So those um, Muslims that think otherwise, think he hates all of Muslims, yeah, they did, they f they'd fed him, like, bad stuff. And so pretty much he only survived with cans of tuna, and he looked pretty thin when he came out. But right now, I hope he's, like, I hope he's back on his, like, current weight track. Yeah, yeah, he looks pretty good now, and he's and he certainly got his energy <laughs> back, at, uh, de uh, definitely. Now, everyone thought it was a, co a coincidence that Tommy was taken off Facebook and Instagram just after this documentary premiered and before the the BBC's own uh, Panorama program went to air. So they obviously didn't like the reach that he was getting exposing the BBC and they didn't want him to reply to what the BBC events eventually showed. And it should be pointed out that a person who's joined Facebook in the UK is uh, Nick Clegg. Uh, he is the former Liberal Democrats leader in the UK, which is a, a left-wing party. And when yeah. a left leftist politicians work for Facebook, uh, I'm quite suspicious. Yeah, I'm quite suspicious as well. I mean, like, think about it. Why else would Facebook and Instagram just ban him off immediately after the Panadrama rally? What, why else? And why specifically Tommy Robinson? And others that mention his name on social media, they get kicked off too. Yeah, and there was a whole bunch of people yeah. who got uh, their profiles zucked. I know. They got zucked indeed. I think, yeah, something's not right here. Something's not right here, and I really do think there's something up with social media in terms of... um in terms of politics. Now, Tommy, uh, t uh, to his advantage, and he was expecting that Facebook would eventually ban him, and so he started a, a mailing list. It was initially globalaim.co.uk. He said, if I'm ever banned from Facebook, make sure you sign up to this mailing list so we can keep in contact. And this is what I've said to other people who I can see are going to get kicked off social media eventually. I say, start an email list, make sure you've got a, a website or you're on a free speech social media platform like Minds, Gab or, or Bitchute. And Tommy, he, he knew that this was coming and so made sure that he did have this back up. But uh, he wasn't predicting the, the amount of people to, to sign up to the email list. And so the, uh, the Global AIM website crashed. And so now you, you go to uh, tr.news to sign up to Tommy's mailing list. And so he can, he can still reach you. He's still on YouTube. Uh, YouTube and Google are not as bad as Facebook and its associated entities because yeah. Instagram is owned by Facebook as well. So he's, he's still on uh, YouTube. He's still got a, a mass platform, um, but who knows if, if they'll go after him on YouTube as well. Yep, no one can know the future, but yeah, hopefully he still stays on for now. Like, hopefully he can keep on posting on YouTube or anything else because not a lot of people, some some of his followers may not even know how to use social media that well. And YouTube and Google, they're easier to get on and access like his um, videos and what he talks about and his commentary. So if, if he gets banned off of YouTube or if he's not on Google anymore, then um, some of those might not even know how to get into those um, new accounts on different websites that aren't really well known that aren't that like, you know, popular. Mm. In that, to, in terms of um, in media giants such as for YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and so on, etc. Now he was already kicked off PayPal last December, and PayPal has joined the the deplatforming movement. They've also kicked off the the, the Proud Boys and Blair Cottrell from from PayPal. Those two groups, I should mention, have also been deplatformed from Facebook. Uh, Alex Jones, he's been kicked off everywhere: Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter. Uh, Spotify, Apple, 
you name it. And just recently, Neil Erickson was kicked off of Facebook as well. So there's a growing list of right-wing personalities who've been permanently banned from the platform, which just goes to show where fa uh, Facebook... And it shouldn't surprise us that Facebook, because they have policies on hate speech. I mean, if you have a... like. If you have a policy on hate speech, which is an entirely subjective term, uh, then we all know who it's going to go after. Well, yeah, even like, even look, whether you, whether or not you agree with their politics or ma no matter what, everyone deserves the right to have your own opinion. It's a free country. And as a free country, social media is also free to use as well. Left wing, I believe in my opinion, both the left, right and center voices should be um, like, voiced out on YouTube as part of freedom of speech. When you're, when I see more right-wing, like, personalities getting banned off of, like, social media and Facebook and Twitter and everything, it just shows, like, the whole bias into, from the social media, again, with the bias. Like, I've seen Twitter posts that call for actual, like, pedophilia to become a human right, and they actually bring up the term that... After nine months, and the baby is literally about to come out of the stomach, as soon as the baby is born, the woman should have the right to kill it, and they say, kill all babies, and those posts and those accounts don't get deleted, and they might just be, like, jerks, you know, jerks online, or maybe far left, or maybe even far right, but it's mainly right-wing voices. Right-wing voices, mainly, they're usually the ones that get banned off, and not, and they're not even the worst of it, and I'm um, like... Yeah, it's it's political bias, and um, a lot of people like us, and a lot of people in the um, Patriot movement and in the culture war, they're speaking out against it, and I completely understand why now. Like, I've seen those posts, I don't think Twitter and that are doing their job. If you're gonna actually, like, ban someone, ban the actual extremists, not political voices, or even people who describe themselves as, you know, politicians, because at the end of the day, everyone deserves the right to ha say what they want to say. Yeah, I've seen those experiments where somebody's posted an anti-white post on Facebook and they've reported it and they've said, oh, it doesn't go against our community standards. Then they've posted an anti-black post and then it says this is hate speech. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a bit hypocritical. Probably social justice warriors. <laughs> Now, as I said, Tommy will survive this. Well, he's got too big a following to simply... Simply all these social media platforms deleting him. It's, it's not going to make him disappear. I mean, even when the, the courts suppressed that he was in prison, word, word still got out, everyone still knew. And, and so Tommy, Tommy the man and the movement behind him is still unstoppable. And Tommy's wise because he's been, been in this... Uh, activism for, for, for so many years, so he's gonna he's gonna keep going and continue his activism, being able to to reach people through any barriers. Absolutely, I mean, I support him. He's not far right. He's not an extremist to me. I mean, like, he's he's got plenty of people on his side. That even like Israelis, Jews, and that, and he's partly a Zionist himself. And so, I wouldn't consider that to be um far right either and so like if the media is going to completely ban him no matter what he's still got my support now the the big story in australia last week was the the guilty verdict against uh, cardinal george powell who was the third highest person in the vatican he was the the treasurer uh that's not the official title but that's just what he was known as now he was found guilty in december of uh child sex abuse in 1996 but it was suppressed until last week when a second trial that was scheduled to take place uh the prosecution decided not to proceed with and now you're a catholic uh, how did you feel about the verdict well the catholic church has never been perfect i'm still i still go to church usually sometimes on sundays but Hearing about this, about George Pell being like, you know, sexually molesting two choir boys and others, honestly, it doesn't really surprise me. I do believe he's guilty and I think it's shameful and disgraceful and he's just another reason what's wrong with my church as well sometimes. I can understand why pe a lot of people are angry and honestly, I don't really get why um, such prominent fig figures like in, in, in conservative politics such as Tony Abbott, Andrew Bolt, I don't, I don't really understand why they're supporting him if he's a convicted felon in terms of pedophilia and sexually assault molesting children and that this it, there's plenty of catholic priests that do that and so count him as part of it as well i wouldn't be so surprised i mean like i heard about this story just last week 
And um, yeah, I wasn't surprised, but it's wrong. It's wrong, and I think he, I think he'll probably deserves his. I think he deserves his time in uh, prison. It's certainly been a divisive verdict, as you mentioned. There's a lot of conservatives who've said that he's innocent, and that the the probability that the crime took place, given that it was in a major, it was in St Patrick's Cathedral when on Sunday Mass, when there was a lot of people there, they they're wondering how, given that there are all these people around, why would he do this when there was a huge chance he could he could get caught, and like the fact that it was in 1996 when he would have known that uh, child sexual abuse in the the Catholic Church was coming becoming a prominent issue, and also. The, the two victims, uh, one of them is deceased, and so they've also pointed out that there's only one victim, and it was his testimony that uh, led to the, the conviction. But as a lot of people have said, that there, there were two juries. The, the first jury was a hung jury. They couldn't come to a verdict, so there was a retrial. And the second jury unanimously found him guilty. And obviously, they, they, they were convinced that beyond a reasonable doubt and obviously we haven't heard from this one remaining victim but obviously he w he was very convincing to the to the jury and the fact that he, he he's he's not this victim is not seeking infamy by pursuing this charge against Pell. he said i don't want to be contacted i don't want to be defined by this don't find out who i am i'm a private uh, family person and so he's certainly doing this because he wants to put this behind him. He's, he's not sort of wanting to put himself out there. I'm a, a victim of the Catholic Church. Yeah, I know. Sometimes it's not so easy for the victims themselves. And um, I understand they don't want all that media attention. But yeah, this this keeps happening and keeps happening. Like it's sort of trending, like this sort of thing that's happening in terms of um, Pell's testimony and the, what the victim stated. And um, yeah, it's trending right now and everyone wants to talk to the victims about how they're doing and what they think should happen and what their opinions are. But yeah, I understand why they don't want to be like in the cameras right now. Like what happened? Like, yeah, I do believe it's a disgrace. And um, I think somewhere in the room at St. Patrick's Cathedral, I think I heard about one in one of the rooms is where like Pell did it. So no one could hear or no one could see because they do have some pretty thick walls there in church. Also, what factored into the verdict is that Pell is not a, a liked figure in the public. He's described as having a, a cold demeanor. If you've ever heard him speak, he's, he, he, kind of, he comes across as very dry. He doesn't show any emotion at all. And, and victims of childhood sexual abuse and the Catholic priests by Catholic priests have described dealing with, with Powell as he was very defensive, didn't show them any sympathy. I think one uh, family described him as uh, socio-apathic and there, when he testified before the Royal Commission into Childhood Sexual Abuse when he was asked about a, a case there was a a line which which really uh, f uh, p uh, people took offence at where he said it was a sad story this sexual abuse and it wasn't of much interest to me which the whole hearing room was shocked when that was said well yeah because honestly like i think he was um i think he was lying when they did call him a sociopath like in the in the way he did it like he showed no remorse and no feelings well yeah can you can you really blame him for that one like he has said that he's never done this before george pell says like he's never he has feelings and that he's done this kind of things before. I'm sure deep inside he does. That's why he became a priest. And also Pell's not liked uh, by critics of the Catholic Church because he is a staunch conservative within the church on things such as abortion, homosexuality, climate change. And that's also why these conservatives have come to his defense. Well, they, they believe he's been targeted because he is a conservative. You mentioned Tony Abbott, Andrew Bolt, John Howard wrote a character reference for George Powell. And there was a line in there that said, uh, despite uh, the that this guilty finding it doesn't change my uh, view of the of the cardinal which I think to say that it doesn't change your opinion on someone when they're being found guilty of sexual crimes against children I think that's very insulting to the the victims yeah. like it's it's one thing to say that you don't believe that he's guilty but it's another thing to say if he is guilty I still think he's a good person well yeah I see we I see where you're coming from on that one but um yeah, like, if he, even if he is conservative on politics and everything, like I am as such, 
for example, it doesn't mean you should um doesn't mean you should ignore the fact that he still did a very bad thing. And um, all sides of politics, whether or not, regardless of politics, you still got to call out the person who raped them. Rape is not po is not a political issue. He did that thing, and um, I don't think you should just be defending him just because he's conservative. I think you should um interrogate him a little bit more and um address him for, and like for as to why he um did all this as they did in court like you just don't you don't ignore you don't ignore them just because of their politics you don't ignore their crimes you just um you got to address them that's what they did in court and um there are other conservatives out there that are still like criticizing him for it and they're still um and they're listening to what the victims had to say this isn't a me too movement issue it is um it is actually a real issue and it's and it's happening pretty it's happening pretty fast and pretty like recently the the wider public reaction because now it can be discussed on on social media has been very scathing and savage of Pell and the catholic church there's been comments like hang him from federation square and I wouldn't say that the right is united in defending Powell. It seems to be the conservative establishment, the nationalist community. Mm. They've been really mm. angry about, about this and ha have really laid into the, the, the Catholic Church. I don't think I've seen any nationalist uh, defend Powell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think I've seen any nationalists like defend Powell either. I mean, like, I understand why they're angry as well, but... um. Yeah, I've seen on the news as well. I think some people have been like, I think some people have spat at George Pell and saying that he should burn in hell for it. But um, yeah, I say let the authorities do their thing to him in prison and let him serve his time. Well, there's still an appeal uh, to happen. Uh, that's what a lot of conservatives have been saying. There's still an appeal. Uh, the the court of appeal will only uh, reverse the jury finding if they see it to be unreasonable, and that is quite highly unlikely but we'll see how it is because there was a a former archbishop of adelaide philip wilson who recently had his conviction for covering up uh, child sexual abuse overturned uh, on appeal so it could still still happen and like i like i said i hope that the jury has made the the right decision because if the the Court of Appeal overturns this, it's forever going to be in public debate whether this took place or not, or whether it was an anti-Pell, anti-Catholic witch hunt. Well, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, like, it's going to go completely viral. It's basically the mainstream media is going to have their story if that were to happen, if it were to be overturned, because, yeah, it's just, it's going to be wild. But uh, hopefully, that, hopefully that shouldn't happen in that. Otherwise, then, yeah, it's going to be a whole lot of drama. Now, the, the annual Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras uh, took place last weekend. Now, the Unshackled every year takes a stance against it, calling it for it to be banned on public decency round, mm -hmm. grounds. You criticised it, the, the virtue signalling of the, the police and the, the various corporations there. What's your view on it? Do you agree with us that it should be banned? or? Well, the same-sex marriage debate is already solved. The people of Australia voted. It's there. And so... As part of democracy, I guess we have to respect that. You don't have to like it if it goes against like our religious values or our Christian beliefs or any other religious beliefs for that matter. But um, yeah, since it's already issued and gays can like get married in that, Aussie pr pride marches or even Anzac Day pride marches can get criticised deeply by leftists, and um, they don't do the same thing about the um, Mardi Gras. And um, when people celebrate. And when the law enforcement show up there and take pictures with those for dressing in drag, like it kind of like it gives it, it gives it gives it sort of it can give you a bit of a bad vibe. Like if you truly don't care about the police or if you're like not politically motivated, you probably won't care about them taking a picture with that. But if you look at the big picture, then yeah, it will give them a bad vibe in that. I mean, like law enforcement. I believe law enforcement and military should be completely separate from politics. Politics comes second in terms of law enforcement and uh, military, and. Look, the police, look, the police can have their own opinion on this, we all can all have our own opinions on this, but I think you shouldn't take a um, picture with them. I don't think our law enforcement or our police shouldn't be taking pictures with them and that. I don't believe, like, I don't support the city, I don't support the Mardi Gras either, and I think it should be, like, you know, gone, but that's just my opinion, that's just my opinion. Like, I don't hate the people there just because, they're again, they're celebrating it, I just think it's, like, a bad influence on, like, society and, and in our culture as a whole. Yeah, like, 
the right to be gay in our society doesn't give you the right to parade around the streets half naked in hypersexual uh, poses. Absolutely. And I don't think that taxpayer money should be spent on it. And I don't think that the, the three major political parties, Labor, Liberal and, and Green, uh, should be there to, to campaign. Uh, th that seems to be uh, an insult. And, let's, and it's also on a public road. The, the roads are closed down for the evening and also children can attend and even children have marched in the parade. That's really disturbing. Yeah, it's disgusting. I mean, like... To see kids marching in the Mardi Gras parade, they should be completely separated from that. They should be completely, they should stay away from as far as they can as possible because they could grow up to be, they could be brainwashed and they could grow up into becoming like drag queens and all that. And um, I don't like, I don't, I don't get like who, what kind of a parent would want that for their kid? And do the parents really want that? Even if they do support the um, Mardi Gras parade or if they go there, do they really want their kids to be around there at least until they learn if they grow up? But then again, we've still got problems with the education system. Like, it's rotten and it's poisoning our minds with, um, with left-wing beliefs or center-left politics. But yeah, children shouldn't attend this march and, like, it's, it's wrong. Like, that's one of the reasons that doesn't give me hope. Like, there are people that, like, people like me, as a young conservative, I've been told that I give people and, like, the baby boomers and the elders, like, hope for the future in Australian politics because... Like, younger generations like us, we're, we're a rare breed. But I think the next generation, like Gen Z, is more conservative than the millennial generation. And, um, yeah, I guess, like, we won't let our kids make the same mistake in the, in the future when if this continues to go on or if it continues to increase or if it continues to get any worse because, yeah, it's, it's, it's wrong. Like, don't ever bring your kids there to the Mardi Gras. And the mainstream media was nothing but fawning over the event. They were like, oh, how wonderful is this celebration? Look how fun it is. There was no dissenting voice allowed to say, hey, I don't think this is an appropriate event to have in public. I don't think this is healthy for, for our society. And I mentioned the politicians before, pretty much it's shoved to us that oh, this event is great and uh, how could anyone possibly object to it? you can expect it from politicians and the mainstream media but like back then like over 20 years ago or probably even before that do you think th do you think the mainstream media would have applauded it do you think they would have like found the mardi gras to be lauded i mean like i'm confused like as an in from my from me at, at an individual level i'm confused why do they even think about their kids or something like do they think about their kids if they went to a mardi gras parade or if they thought about anyone else like do they like understand the long-term effects of what a mardi gras can cause within australian society because if you look at other countries like certain states in united states in the united states uh italy uh russia and turkey for example would they do this mm. you don't see their law enforcement doing this and um from what, from my perspective, it seems like they've got things they've got they got things under control over there. Like they can handle like situations pretty good, and um, they can handle them with ease. But it sort of makes us it makes us look it makes the law enforcement here look weak. Like I said, it gives them a bad vibe. Like you look at what's going on with the British police, the Swedish. Yeah, like it's a bit of a disease. It's a disease that's like inflecting across the West right now. Yeah, definitely. Now, I thought that we should finish off by doing a, a Trump update because there's always a news Love and Donald drama Trump. with uh, the Trump presidency. Now, his former lawyer, Michael Cohen, has, has turned on him. Now, let's remember that Michael Cohen has pled guilty to uh, fraud, campaign finance violations, and lying to Congress. He was the one that paid off uh, Stormy Daniels during the, the 2016 presidential campaign to keep her affair with Donald Trump secret. Now, he testified before Congress this week, and that's what he was, he just pled guilty to, lying to Congress. And now we're supposed to believe his testimony at Congress. And he pretty <laughs> much didn't say anything of substance. He just said that Trump is a racist, he's a, a con man, and he's a cheat. He's a sexist, he's a misogynist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What else could you expect from Michael Cohen anyway? Basically, it's it's sort of he's he's always been sort of a distraction from Trump's work as as the president of the United States. As an example, just recently, like days ago, 
Trump's over in Vietnam. He meets with the North Korean dictator, Kim Jong-un himself. They meet again, hand to hand, have a discussion about denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula, which I think is a very great thing. At least Trump had a second summit with him. It wasn't as successful as the first one, but he still had a summit with him. And I highly doubt Barack Obama could ever get them to um, go to a meeting and have a discussion about it. Kim Jong-un, he expected more from um, Trump about it. He expected like all sanctions to be lifted. Maybe he thinks Trump is stupid, but I, tr I don't trust Kim Jong-un. As an Australian citizen, I still don't trust well, him. Well, he's the leader of a murderous totalitarian regime. I don't think you should trust somebody like that. And the North Koreans have a history of, of lying about their, their, their weapons program to uh, the West. This uh, conflict, or cold conflict, whatever you want to call it, has been going on for, for 25 years. Yeah, I know, but that's why I agree. That's why I agree with the um, summit, the summits. Like, maybe they'll have a third summit or anything, but um, yeah, at least Trump talked to him and at least Trump stood up like a real president. Like, he didn't just take it. He didn't just buy his nonsense or anything else he was trying to say. He actually stood up and said that, no, the, the sanctions will stay and we will have to postpone and make another, another summit at another time at a later date. Meanwhile, lawyer Michael Cohen, he's, um, yeah... He testified in court, I mean, at, in Congress. Mm. Yeah, he testified in Congress, and apparently he was lying about everything. And, yeah, I'm not surprised either. Like, this, because up, up until this day, the Steele dossier, which is the Russian investigation Unverified. Dossier, yeah, the unverified Russian invest interference in the US 2016 election. There's still no evidence of that, and there's no proof of that. If you haven't found ev any evidence about Russia colliding or hacking US servers to influence the election... You won't find it ever. Like, the, sure, the Soviet Union used to had hacking. They used to hack other countries in the West like a while ago. And maybe the Russian Federation did as well. I don't know. But I don't think, yeah, I highly doubt. And I actually believe 100% they didn't actually um, hack the US election. It's very, very, very uncertain. And it's very unlikely. Michael Cohen, yeah. It was, a, it was basically a circus what happened to him. And now he's going to jail for it. And <laughs> I guess we can all laugh about it. Yeah, although it does go against Trump that he hired somebody like Cohen in the first place who sat on the, the Trump uh, organization board for, for 10 years. Uh, so obviously that was an error by Trump to uh, trust somebody who's done all, all of these crimes and who's now turned on him and is willing to, to dish the dirt on him. But as you mentioned, there's still no evidence of Russian collusion, even though there's been two years uh, of digging. The only thing is that they're, they're clutching at is that Trump wanted to build a Trump Tower in Moscow, that uh, which hasn't been built. And that was just a, a, a project that they were exploring. But do you really think that Trump would uh, diminish US interest as a president just because he wanted to build a tower in Moscow? Well, building Trump Towers, that was part of his business. This was before Trump became like involved actively on politics. He knew about politics and he's p smart on it in terms of like American interests and American values. But um, Trump building Trump Towers or building anything in the Trump organization was part of his business, not a political thing. If he builds, like when Michael Cohen, when, um, when he talked about Trump building like a um, hotel in Russia, like what would that have to do it? What would that have to do with um, his actual presidency and um, his ability to get the job done? I mean, like, mm. everyone, a lot of people who are anti-Trump are very wary of him. They believe that Russia did were involved, and um, they believe that, he, that Trump is a puppet of Putin, as they like to say, or like to call it out, because they just don't understand sometimes, I don't think, in my opinion. But um, building a... If, even if Trump build, built a hotel in Moscow, would that still affect him in any way? Because, like... Anyone these days in the West, nationalists or anything else, if right-wingers or nationalists these days win an election in the West and um, and they don't have a, like, a basically like a centre... They, they basically don't have like a left-wing government in charge or a globalist um, ch in charge, basically, that will contribute to the United Nations before their nations first. They will claim that Russia hacked their, their elections and Russia hacked into their voting system. They already said that about... Um, Matteo Salvini, the Deputy Minister of Italy, they said that about Jair Bolsonaro, the new Brazilian president, and they said that they, they even they even helped with the Brexit campaign. And I'm like, 
I think it's anti-Russian settlement in that. I mean, like, some basically some people still think the Cold War is still going on, or they still think we're in a new type of Cold War with them, in terms of the Middle East and Syria and everything else, and, um, authoritarian causes. But, um... I don't know. I think it's just anti-Russian sentiment, I think. And Trump has actually been quite hard on Russia in reality. Let's not forget that the, the arms treaty between Russia and the US has been uh, torn up, uh, even though that's been in place for, for, for 30 years. And if Trump... I uh, to say that Trump is looking to get some financial gain from Russia, this is a man who's lost money as president. His net worth has, has gone down. He's not taking a paycheck as president. He he gives it away to uh, various charities. So he, he's certainly not doing this for the money. <laughs> Absolutely. He's doing it for the American people. He only gets $1 as president, but... That's what I love about him. He took the job. Like, he takes the regulations off the back of those corporations that are being imposed by new democratic socialists in the United States. He's, um, he's putting all the, his money into building the wall, like American dollars into building the wall, because whether or not your opinion on the wall is good or not, that wall is going to protect the United States and it's going to protect the southern border. Yeah, he cares about the safety of the American people first. And, um, yeah, so far... Look at the successes he's doing right now. He's getting the economy moving again, lowering taxes for, for the workers and for people there in the United States. But um, yeah, sometimes yeah. But I, I just I don't agree with some of his um protectionist policies mm, because I'm, I'm a, yeah I'm a supporter of free trade and it's sort of like our, our his allies like it's kind of like giving us a bit of an economic like budget crisis and that and sort of, we're sort of like it's damaging our um jobs and that and so the trade war with China well yeah that's a whole different story. Uh, but Trump, uh, despite these setbacks during the week, Cohen and not getting anything out of Kim Jong-un at Hanoi, he came back to, to CPAC, the, the annual conservative conference, and gave a, a rousing uh, speech where he was in his campaigning element laying into his political opponents. That was classic Trump. Yep. Bloody oath, classic Trump. <laughs> Trump 2020, make America great again. As a naked cowboy once said in New York, anything else is stupid. <laughs> well, Johnny, it's been good to have you uh, back on the show. I do hope that you are uh, making a comeback into the media scene because I certainly value your your contribution and we'll definitely cross paths again at least uh, at the next uh, event. Yep, we will see what we can do. I'll see what I can do and hopefully I won't be too busy, but I might have things to do. But other than that, yeah, I'll be, I'll be back to see you guys there again in the future sometime. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. Now, an update on the tours we've been promoting on The Unshackled and at the end of every show, the Dr. Stephen Hicks Adventures in Postmodernism Tour, hosted by True Arrow Events, has had to be cancelled due to unforeseen circumstances, and the Deplorables Tour, featuring Marla Yiannopoulos, Tommy Robinson and Gavin McGuinness, is set to take place in less than a week. However, visas for the speakers have still not been granted, despite the Home Affairs Department stating to organise organizer Penthouse Australia that a decision would have been made last week, so time is definitely running out. We hope that this tour can still take place as it has been delayed many times, but these developments are certainly not good for free speech and open debate in Australia. One tour I'm more confident will take place is the Conversation About Feminism tour featuring bad feminist Roxane Gay and factual feminist Christina Hoff Summers, which should prove to be a lively debate. Please go to thisis42.com slash feminist to book your tickets. The Unshackled is once again a sponsor of the next Liberty Fest conference, which is happening this week in Perth, and it is organised, as always, by our good friends at Liberty Works. It is taking place on the 8th and 9th of March, but there are plenty of other events happening around Perth during that time, and you can still book tickets by going to libertyfest.org.au. Remember that The Unshackled can only expand with the support of our followers. We have had some recent upgrades to The Unshackled's operation, so it's important you find a way to support us. You can pledge over at patreon.com slash The Unshackled and directly via PayPal me slash The Unshackled. We also have our premium membership option on our website, theunshackled.net slash support options slash premium membership. We are still waiting for our Subscribestar account to be approved, so that will be another way to support us and a one that will definitely support free speech. So thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. 
Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.